Can everyone hear me? Just sort of nod. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, it's amazing that we're how many thousands of miles away and we're connecting. It's just shocking to me. Um, in truth, I'd rather be where you are I'd like to see you in person, uh, to feel you and to have a sense of who you are. But this is what we have, and uh, I'm grateful for that. So let me begin with um, a Sufi saying that is very beautiful to me about p different paths that people follow. And the saying is, there are as many paths to God as there are the breaths of men. Let me say that one more time. There are as many paths to God as there are the breaths of men. Tonight, I'm, we're only focusing in on this one path, the path work. And there are so many paths to God, but this particular one has very specific uh, and unique qualities about it. So let me try to give you an overview. And I think actually what I'll start with um, is about how the path came to be, the path work. Uh, Eva Purakos, her, at that time, her name was Eva Brock, was, um, and actually before that, it was um, Eva Wasserman. Her father was a famous Austrian novelist. She grew up and was born in uh, Austria. And, and these are her words. She saw herself as a rather superficial person wanting to have fun in life. She was a dancer. She loved chocolate. She loved to ski. And she joined a group many years later uh, to do some meditation. And she was in Switzerland at the time. And she was gazing out at the moon one night from her window. And she felt compelled to go over to the writing desk, pick up a pencil, and her hand just started to move without her volition. And basically, she was terrified that that was happening. And at first, just the squiggles came out. And then gradually there were words, messages. And she thought she was going crazy. Now, let me back up about 15 years before that, where her mother had taken Eva and her sister to a seance. And her mother said to them, okay, you can sit in the back, but I don't want you to laugh. You just be quiet. Well, of course, her sister and her <laughs> were laughing, you know, poking each other. And yet Eva said she couldn't quite let go, uh, that there was something positive or some something real happening. So when this experience happened many years later in Switzerland, where she was writing, the automatic writing, she remembered the woman who had given her the seance and she called her up and asked her for help with this. And the woman said, yes, I could teach you. And so she began getting lessons in automatic writing. And after a while, Eva surpassed this woman in her ability to just do the automatic writing. She actually started to have the ability to channel. And she went to the Swiss Research Psychic Research Institute and learned how to go into trance. 
And when she went into trance, and I don't know how many of you know much about uh, dealing or connecting with the spirit world, but when you are open, like a telephone off the hook, many people or many beings, let's say, from the other world try to give you messages to connect with other people. And sometimes those messages were mischievous. So she really had to focus on a very particular voice that would come through that had a wisdom and a strength to it. And that voice ended up being what we call the guide for lack of a better name. And this guide instructed Eva that she had to first purify her, uh, I guess you'd call them the ego, where she'd want to satisfy her ego, that she could do this. She had to purify that and work on herself. And then she would get messages that she would be uh, channeling where over in America, and she was shocked by that. She couldn't believe how she would end up in America. And that there would be many people that would come around her, a community would grow around her, and that it would never be advertised. It would just be people somehow being drawn. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. The first lectures that Eva gave, the first 10 were given over in Europe and they were in German. And then she came to America and the, the lectures would be in English. And let me give you just a little sense of what that looked like. You might find this interesting because I went to the early lectures when she would, uh, give them in her home and there would maybe be 30, 40 people lined up in her living room and Eva would sit on a straight back chair and she'd have her hands on her thighs and she'd play some classical music and put some incense and she'd do this kind of breathing that sounded something like this. And then she'd fall forward slightly and her hands would come up and move back and forth like this. Her eyes would be closed <laughs> and she would say, greetings and blessings, my dearest friends here. It had a slight accent to it. Well, <laughs> She explained that her personality self would be put over here to the this side and she would experience the guide coming through the top of her head, coming down and taking over just the vocal cords. She wasn't one of these transfigurative, you know, where the whole body changes. It was just the uh, cadence of her speech and the, the voice, the words would come forth. Um, so let me just now tell you how I got to the <laughs> uh, Pathwork lectures. And, th and this is the amazing thing. We all come in different ways. I came, I had been uh, in college when I was 17. And I had a Shakespeare professor named John Saley. And John, he never talked about the path work at all. He was already involved, but he brought out the universal truths that were in Shakespeare's plays. And I had never heard anyone talk like this. It was brilliant. So we remained friends. 
And then many years uh, after I had graduated, I went on to graduate school and uh, my parents offered me a trip to Europe and I decided to take a class in Italy and Greece with John Saley. Uh, we were learning Greek and Roman literature in translation. And we got, I got to know his family, but he never ever talked about the pathwork. But we traveled together, he and I and his family and got to be good friends. And then he asked me, would I, uh, while he and his wife were going on sabbatical, would I take care of his kids? I had already been teaching, but I would help them out. So I was taking care of their kids and I was in their room looking at their books and, you know, you get a sense of who someone is when you're looking at what they read. And um, all of a sudden I came across these lectures and these very uh, wise lectures. I, when they came back from sabbatical, I confessed I had been looking around or snooping around their room. And they said, well, maybe you would like to come with us sometime. This very wise woman gives these lectures. Okay, I said. They didn't tell me that she was a medium. They didn't tell me what these, what this was all about. I just decided I trusted them I'd go. Okay. So we're in the in the road that goes down to the east side of Manhattan in New York. Eva lived in a penthouse apartment there. And John Saley says to me, oh, by the way, Eva is a medium and she goes into trance. And I remember looking at him being so terrified because I was a nice Jewish kid from Queens, Bayside Queens, who grew up that anything to do with uh, things like that are evil or uh, chicanery of some sort. So I said, okay, I looked at him and I thought, I trust this man. He's not going to take me to anything too crazy. So we arrive. Uh, at Eva's apartment, and you'll, I think you'll appreciate this. Because I didn't know much about mediums, I pictured in my mind that she would look like a, a bird watcher from Maine, the state of Maine, with little tight curls, uh, gray hair, a sagging bosom, and pearls. This was my image of what a medium might look like. So we get to the door, Eva's door, knock on the door, and this very uh, sensual, uh, very attractive woman, dark hair, looked almost Brazilian in a way, that sensual quality. And she, welcomed us in and I was sort of taken aback that this is what a medium looked like. And the Saleys, John and Judith Saley, insisted that we sit in the front row. In the meantime, I'm terrified, but I'm going along with this idea. And I wanted to sit in the back. I wanted to be detached. I wanted to judge, run out if I had to. And um, all right, so then Eva puts on some music and the candle. It was a classical piece of music. And all the while this is going on, I have like one eye closed and I'm looking, where are the wires? I thought maybe somebody was feeding her these words. This is how suspicious I was at what was happening. So uh, finally, the guide came through and there was such a ring of truth to what was being said 
that I felt the layers of fear just peel away like a skin of an onion. And I felt relaxed. And there was a lot of resonance in what he was saying. So I kept going back. And that was in 1971. So that uh, gives you just paint a picture of <laughs> how someone could go to something like this. I didn't know that I had that kind of longing for what the pathwork actually teaches us to do, which is basically to find this treasure that is buried inside of us, this great light that exists in every soul, but has been covered over like an old lantern with encrustations for lifetimes of misconceptions, of defenses, of misunderstandings, negativity. So this pathwork is about removing the obstacles so that you can experience yourself as that light, as that radiance your true self, your higher self. There are many, many names one could call that, but I think you get the idea. Um, the guide said that the path work is both, um, it has a psychological approach and it has a metaphysical approach. It uses the truth of those two paths, psychological truths and metaphysical truths, in order to, to free this encumbered spirit that we have. Uh, it takes a lot of dedication. It takes courage because it's a path of self-facing. You're looking at yourself, where am I not in truth about life? Where am I blocking the abundance of life? Where am I separating myself from others? Where do I separate myself from myself? So you need courage. You need the dedication to wanting to know the truth. And you need a very good sense of humor. Because when we find things out, we have to laugh. Because we're the joke. <laughs> it's not, we can lighten up about it. It doesn't have to be a heavy, oh, I have to dig up my lowest self, all my darkness. Yeah, it's there. And we can hold it lightly. And we need to be able to welcome the pain that inevitably we will find underneath all that. The pain of being rejected, the pain of disappointment, the pain of helplessness. Every human being goes through this. And yet we block this and we become defended. But it's only when we learn how to live an undefended life when we can let down what guard, all the guards that we have to loving, to living fully, that's, that's what we're about in this work. Um, and it makes the path in that way a little bit different than many of the 
spiritual paths that you hear about where the focus is on going toward the positive. But you need first to deal with that which is not positive in you. Um, in a way, we could say that this work is about learning how to die. Dying to that which you fear. It's only when you can be willing to die, to let go of your pride, your self-will, and your fear. Pride says, I must be more than I am in this moment. Or I have to be better than you. Or I can't be less than you. That's pride. And self-will, self-will says, it's my way. I want what I want when I want it. When we insist that things have to be the way we want. And fear says, oh my God, if I feel this, I'm going to perish. It'll be the end of me. I'll be annihilated. So that's part of the learning in this work. And we do that with a helper. A helper is someone who has already done a bit of work on themselves and now wants to be with you to help you make these connections, to help you feel safe enough to go into the pain. And it takes time. It's a lifetime's work. It's not a weekend that you can go to and all of a sudden you've gotten it. It's, it's a daily practice where you write down in a daily review where were you feeling a bit off? Where were you mean to someone or cruel or frustrated and impatient you really look at what goes on in your own psyche there, there's a great line in one of the lectures where the guide says do this path in a relaxed way with gladness in your heart. And the gladness comes from the fact that you're doing the work, I wanna say God's work, but in, in the sense that you are God, you have God within you, you're doing the work to remove all these obstacles. And in removing those obstacles, you get to a deeper level in the work where you meet what the guide calls the lower self and the higher self and the mask. And now you're in a metaphysical reality. Now you're dealing with the forces of good and evil. But that takes time. You have to first do the early work of being very much aware of what your defenses are. You see, the first segment is the purification process that I just described. And then you go, so that's sort of the, 
the first act of the drama that you're really going to deal with, which is, are you going to give over to the light or are you going to hold on to your destructiveness? And that calls us to pray, to meditate, to align ourselves daily with the truth and with love. Um, one of the key factors, I just want to go back a minute and talk about uh, when we bring up all this, this very rigorous inquiry that we do into ourselves, we also have to accept what does come up, things we don't like about ourselves. And there's a wonderful poem that I want to read to you from, and maybe you know it, it's called The Guest House by Rumi, the great, yeah, you know him. Okay, that's great. Some people know. Rumi is a wonderful mystic from the 13th century, and it's called The Guest House. He says, this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. So momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. What Rumi is setting up here is like we each have to become the, the very generous and hospitable host of the guest house. Because every day something new emerges in us. One day we're angry, one day we're depressed, you know, we're, we're I don't know, mean. It, but you are not that, but you are there is a part of us that's larger than that that can observe it and welcome it, find out about it, make it some tea and jam and say, tell me, who are you? What do you have to teach me? So we have to cultivate this attitude of kindness and compassion and acceptance which is not the same as condoning things, but we don't make ourselves 100% bad. It's just one part of us. So the work again is about how do we conciliate the opposites that we face on the earth plane? There's good and bad, happiness and unhappiness, pleasure, pain. How do we hold both with equanimity?
So I want to give you a sense of what that could feel like. Are you up for it? You're willing to try something? Okay. So I want you to sit quietly, sit straight, and have your um, palms up like so on your thighs and close your eyes. And I want you to think of some trait in you that you cherish. That's a beautiful trait. It could be kindness, it could be curiosity, humor, it could be anything. And take that trait and put it in one of the palms of your hands. And just feel the weight of that. And now, in your other hand, you're going to place some fault or weakness that you have, something that you don't find very attractive about yourself, and put it in the other palm and feel the weight of that. It could be jealousy. It could be uh, cruelty. Whatever it is, just, just put it in the other palm. And now send the thought into your soul substance. Take the thought, put it into your soul substance. I want to accept both of these equally. My greatness and my weakness. And see how far down that goes into you, that desire to accept both equally. And now, with your eyes closed, bring your two palms together in front of your heart in a prayer pose. And again say, I accept all of me. And see how you feel inside, if there's more of a spaciousness. And then, keeping your eyes closed, make a gesture with your hands. How would it be if you accepted all of yourself? How would it be how would you be if you moved out into life with this acceptance, deep acceptance of who you were? Um, I, I wish that everybody could see everyone. I don't know, I'm gonna just move here and just see how people are. Very sweet. Yeah. Huh. Well, that's great. So I, I hope that you got just a 
taste of that as a possibility for your lives in doing this kind of work. Um, if you incidentally have questions, uh, we're going to do the questions a little bit later, I think. I'm wondering whether we should do them in between in case people are, if there are any burning questions, there's a place where the chat is and you could, uh, Luigi, are you around? Can, can you pick a question now if someone has a specific um, inquiry about this so far? Yes, so we have one question from Marina and she asked if self-will is the same as control. Ah, okay, good question. Uh, Maria, it's, if there, first of all, there's healthy control and there's unhealthy control. If we're talking about our self-will, where I want what I want when I want it, that would be unhealthy control. Yeah. Is that, how do I say, is that, <laughs> does that make sense? Can she write back or how does this work? Yes, she said, th yes, thank you. Okay, good. And anyone else? Ah. Marina, I see. Thank you. See that, yeah. Another person asks if you had the opportunity to listen to Eva Channel the lectures live. Oh yes, very much so. I as I oh maybe you didn't hear my uh, beginning of when I first went to the lectures, uh, my experience of fear and then finding everything was great <laughs> and safe. But yes, I, I continued to, to go to the lectures for, let's see, Eva died in 1979. So from 1971 to 1979, I went to those lectures. And let me tell you something I didn't say before. Experiencing them live, we were a group of individuals that gathered every Wednesday or every other Wednesday night. Um, when the guide came through, it was very palpable. There was this feeling in the room that as if we were all on a cloud, we were being lifted on some level. It was a very powerful experience. I, I wish I don't know if you could listen to those lectures. We have them on tape, but I don't know whether you'd get that same uh, experience, but it was wonderful, very healing, uplifting. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else before I go on? There's just one more. Yeah. Uh, she's asking if by accepting our resilience, uh, our re resistances, is yeah. the same as liking them? <laughs> uh, no. To accept them, there's a wonderful phrase that I want to leave you that the path or uh, that the pathwork guide talks about. We are here to be utterly and merely human utterly and merely human. If we can accept that as human beings, we're going to have resistance, we can accept ourselves for that. Doesn't mean we have to give into that resistance. We may want to find out about that resistance, why we have it. Usually it comes from some deep misconception that we don't even, we're not even conscious of. So it's not that we like 
the resistance. You don't have to like it, but to accept that you have it, yeah. Yeah, and that's part of giving up the pride that I should be better. I should be more than I am. I shouldn't have resistances. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> because we're here on the earth plane with the whole point being that we're here to work through these very misconceptions that we came here to work through so that the soul could expand so that the spirit could live fully through us. I hope that helps, does it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we could put up, let me see, uh, the, the, uh, the three eyes, the chart, I'm gonna show you this chart. <laughs> For you guys, it'll be easy. Okay, I have to find my own though, wait a minute. Oh dear, okay. Just give me a minute. I need to find mine in English. That would be good, Judith. Okay. All right. So, all right. This is a way to look at how we um, become whole. If we can identify in us what the guide calls as the child consciousness. And child consciousness is the one that is in duality, that makes things an either or, black or white, all or nothing thinking. Where we make one thing 100% good and another thing 100% bad. All of us, now I'm going to give you some examples. Um, when we're in duality, that is, we have split reality because we've said, oh, this is 100% good, this is 100% bad, or this is 100% painful and this is 100% pleasure. It's like being in a... I don't know if you had these uh, had this in your country, but where I come from, there are these uh, little Chinese thumb finger puzzles where you would put your one finger in in this side, and then the other you would put in here, and then at a party, let's say, they would give these out, and they'd say, "Okay, try to escape." Well, this is like the more you pulled each way, the more you got imprisoned. You couldn't get out. And that's like if I say I only want pleasure in life, I'm running towards what I think will give me 100% pleasure, and I'm running away from what I think will be 100% pain, you could see what happens. But as soon as I relax and allow both to exist, voila, I can be, <laughs> I can actually be free. So let's look at this child consciousness for a moment. When you're a child, that's age appropriate to be in this black or white, all or nothing thinking. Why is that? Because, and actually modern science has proven this by being maybe, uh, being able to map the brain of humans where a child does not have 
what's called the thinking brain, the neocortex online. It's not online. A child comes from the limbic system in the back. They're more about energy. They're more about pleasure. They seek pleasure. They have a memory of pleasure, as you can imagine, coming from the spirit world. Um, so if you watch kids, which I love to do, uh, you watch a kid, let's say, at a grocery store and they see candy. And oh my God, they want that candy because they, they, they want pleasure a hundred percent. That's how they know themselves as pleasure beings. They can't. And the mother said, no, you can't have it now. You have to have it later. Well, a, a child at a certain age can't imagine what later means. They have to have the pleasure now. And at times, if the mother says no, they, they, and maybe you've heard this, they will start screaming bloody murder as if they were dying. I want it now. I have to have it blah, 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 like that. Well, that's an example of child consciousness age appropriately. But as you know, Many of us have gotten taller and a little bit wider, but we still have that child consciousness in us where we are insisting that we only have what is life, not anything that has to do with the dying. We only want pleasure. We don't want pain. We only want happiness. We don't want unhappiness. We only want what's good, we don't want what's bad. Literally, we resist, we're resisting reality. We're fighting reality because life on the earth plane is a 50-50 proposition. It's and, life and death, pleasure and pain, happiness and unhappiness, good and bad. Imagine accepting life as it is. Imagine that, how relaxed you could be, even though it isn't what you hoped in a particular instance, you don't receive the raise you hoped for, you don't meet the partner of your dreams, immediately you accept what is. You had a taste of that when we did the accepting yourself as both good and bad, so to speak, your greatness and your weakness. So in this work, the pathwork is about creating a healthy ego, an ego that holds the opposites equally. We could call that the mature adult consciousness. These little eyes that we have here, those are, we could identify which lenses are we looking through. Am I looking through the child, child's eyes? or the child consciousness, or am I looking through the healthy adult, the healthy ego? When we can have a healthy ego, there's something that happens when we embrace the opposites of life that uh, drops us into the divine consciousness which we could call a hundred percent, a hundred percent bliss, where all life is good. There is only good, only beauty, only pleasure. And notice that that third section where 
under the divine consciousness, it comes from the third eye, the one that sees the unitive consciousness, the all. So that may give you a, a little glimpse into the work of how we learn how to identify where we are in our, <laughs> in what lenses, what glasses are we using to see life. I sometimes, when I go to a, um, a cocktail party and somebody asks me, what, what is my work? You can imagine it's not easy to describe it. So I sometimes say, oh, I'm a spiritual optometrist. <laughs> I help people change their perspective because that's what we're doing here. Um, and that's a very exciting endeavor. Now, uh, let's put up, are there any questions about this chart? first of all, that you need to ask me now. Luigi, if you could see if anybody had a question now. There's no questions. Okay, good. Um, the next uh, chart I wanna show you is the, the great transition. One second. Sure. Our journey. I guess you guys could even take um, a photo shot of, of these charts. Is that right? While we're waiting for him to find that chart, I would like to just give you, I read this Chinese proverb the other day. It would actually make a great um, uh, fortune cookie <laughs> you message. This is a Chinese proverb. It says, tension is who you think you should be. Relaxation is who you are. Tension is who you think you should be relaxation is who you are and that's really what we're after okay so um here is this very one incidentally these charts were made by moira shaw who worked with uh eva for many years uh and was trained by her um but it's a longer story right now that I'll go into, but she, she drew up these charts, which are very helpful. There's a lecture about the great transition in human development. And we are all going home, our true home, where there is the unified consciousness, the love state. I like calling it the love state. Um, every human is going in that movement in evolution. Some of us are taking the local train. Some of us are taking the fast train. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We're all going to get there. In this work, what we're doing is we're taking 
the little ego, which is the child consciousness, which is the weak ego in the adult, where we're caught in the hundred hundred of life, making one thing a hundred percent good and another thing a hundred percent bad. And when we do that, life, we are straining towards what we think is going to be 100% life, and we run away from what we think will be the end of us. We literally resist life as it is. And from that resistance, we experience that we are in this cramped soul movement. We have a forcing current that comes from our will that says, I must have this, otherwise it'll be the end of me. I must have this pleasure. Actually in our country, we just got rid of a president who was very much about the forcing current and the will. And that's not even a political statement, that's just the reality. <laughs> um, so we end up being defended against life and feelings. And we have many demands and we're in illusion and we end up with this false self. So we, we're stuck unless we grow this part of us up by observing where we're caught in child consciousness. The way we get home, which is toward that love state, is through accepting and creating a healthy ego. The healthy ego being that part of us that can hold and contain all of life in a 50-50 way, where we accept duality, where life is pleasure and unpleasure. Actually, notice I said life is pleasure and unpleasure instead of life is pleasure and pain. It's when we resist unpleasure that it becomes painful. Hmm. Try that. The next time you go to the dentist, and not too many people like going to the dentist, Imagine going and not resisting that experience. And you'll see that it just is unpleasurable. Doesn't have to be painful. And actually, if you stay with the unpleasure, eventually it'll turn into pleasure. So this is where in this 50-50, we're willing to die, to ex die to that which we said we don't want to experience or feel. We accept what is. We accept life on its terms. We accept imperfection of ourselves, of others, of life. And in truth, we are perfectly imperfect. That we were meant to be imperfect in order to grow. And we can be relaxed in an inner state where we're compatible with the divine consciousness. When we're relaxed, just like the Chinese proverb, um, t attention is who you think you should be and relaxation is who you are. When we're in that quiet, relaxed state, accepting whatever is, all of a sudden we can be aligned with the divine consciousness. It opens a door. Then we're undefended. We become receptive to life. We're in reality with the small r, 
we accept this temporary reality and we accept who we really are, the real self with the small r, that we're both good and bad temporarily. Our greatness and our weakness, our beauty and our blemish. And from that movement, when we get there, the we can move toward the love state, which is 100% pleasure and bliss and beauty and truth. That is the divine consciousness where we're one. And we transcend duality. We really make a true conciliation of the opposites. And with that, we become one with the cosmic streamings, the energies that are coming in from the cosmos. And the ego, which we've worked to strengthen in a healthy way, will not fracture when these energies come in. It won't shatter. It'll be strong enough to merge with the divine consciousness and experience this state of union with everything, not just with all people, but life itself, everything. And that, that's when we experience reality with the big R and we are our real selves with the big R, the higher self, the enlightened self, the transcendent self. So that is the journey that, that we're going on. We're doing it with a conscious going into where we're not aligned with what is. So if anyone has questions about this, this would be a good time to ask. And Luigi, if you could find out if anyone has specific We have one question, but it's yeah. not specifically about this. It's about the guide. Okay, sure. Okay. So Daniela asked if the guide is a spirit or if it is many spirits with one representing them all. Hmm. That's a, an important question. We've debated this. At times, the guide talked about that there he works with a group of um, other spirits. Um, and that there, one could say maybe there are many guides, but there seemed to be one, a certain voice that was fairly consistent in, um, in the lectures. You know, the lectures started out as, um, I, I see it in thirds. There were 258 lectures that Eva delivered over a 22 year period. The first third were almost religious and, or a, it had more of a cosmological bent where the guide talked about cosmological things. And the people who were drawn at that time were very much astrologers and people who were interested in the occult. And then the next third of the lectures were much more psychological. And it's the, at the time that Eva met John Piracos, who was a psychiatrist, and he brought in a lot of people who were uh, therapists and healers. And then the last third of the lectures, I think of as oceanic, very spiritual, and I had a much wider view. Um, so they changed as the people who came in changed. Fascinating in a way. So I don't know if that helps, but that's my answer to that. Um, 
I want to talk, and, and we're going to be coming to a close before we do question, full question and answers. Um, in 1974, that's quite a while ago, the guide would say very often in a number of those lectures in the early 70s, mid 70s, that there was this great influx coming in. He sometimes called it the Christ force. He sometimes called it the love force. But this divine influx of energy coming in from the cosmos, and it would be hitting people all, all of life, really, and the earth plane. And wherever we were not aligned with spiritual law as an individual, we would find ourselves in crisis. And he said, even institutions who were not aligned with spiritual law would crumble. And if we look around us, I, I'm assuming your countries are experiencing not exactly the same as the United States, but pretty much this, what happened with the pandemic and with, um, you know, the Nazism coming back into, or the authoritarianism coming back into the world. It's like, we are, that's happening because there's this great unearthing that needs to come up. The darkness must come up for us to see it and make the choice to become more aligned with this Christ force. And I tell you that because I feel that that's important for us to hold and that we don't get too despairing about everything and the pain and the struggling and the terrible things that we hear happening, that we hold this, uh, that we're on this journey. And um, I always like when we're in a group of people to take a moment to just pray for the enlightenment. And the guide suggests we do this, that we, we pray for the enlightenment of our fellow beings and even of the earth and just send our good wishes and our good intent for this evolutionary process, which is quickening to come to fruition and to pray for those who are struggling and resisting it. And just join me in that in whatever way you can. So if, if anyone would like to have a question or a statement or anything, that would be wonderful. Luigi, we could drop that chart, I think. We have one more question about the chart saying that in our lives, could we only get to the second column or could we actually get to the third column? Oh, yes, yes, we can get to that third column, absolutely. It almost happens, um, you know, if we've dedicated our lives to, to this work on ourselves and we learn how to be in the 50-50 of life, it's as if a doorway opens and we experience ourselves enjoying life in, in a way that 
even while there's still suffering around, that we enjoy life to the fullest and we open our hearts. You can't really ask for more than that. So is there anything else anybody would like to say or, or anything? <laughs> There's one more saying that uh, she feels as if we are constantly moving between those three columns, those three states. So if you could just explore more on that. Yes, it's true that we do move because we are lopsided in one area and we're all different. Some, some of us are have gained more maturity or came in with more maturity. Um, yes, and w listen, there are moments when we feel the love state. I mean, you watch kids or I just got a new dog. I'm in love with this creature and my heart is totally open. Uh, you know, you go to, you hear a song or you see something that's of nature that just opens you. Sure, we're we're a complex, but we're, that chart is just to give you. You know, it's it's artificial, but it gives you a sense of a movement of evolution. That's where we're all heading. We have one more asking if since you've left us if there's been communication with the guide by someone else i heard that um there's a woman in belgium who says she gets information from the guide i i haven't read what she's what has come through her um i'm not even sure i know her name do you leticia or yeah, yes, Mariana Hubert. Mariana Hubert. Yes, she is going to be here at the last day presenting. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it's been fun for me. I hope it's been clear for you and that you've gotten some taste of this work. And um, I hope some of you will join us at the uh, conference. Um, all right. I want to thank uh, Augustina and um, Mabri where did I, there she is, Marlies. Marlies. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, thank you guys for um, taking my words and making them understood to our our guests. And of course, to Letizia and Luigi and Mario from their, all the work they put in to put this together. Uh, and I thank you guys for being open and willing to listen. So I, I send you a lot of love from New York and uh, I hope to see you one day in person <laughs> okay judith before we close in uh, uh i want to say thank you for you thank you for this beautiful introduction that you did 